Nintendo's Motocross Stadium Racer Excite Bike was one of those games that seemed to be stacked atop everyone's NES in the late 80s. Excite Bike may not seem so groundbreaking at first glance, but Shigeru Miyamoto's careful construction of its simplistic yet immersive design convinced shoppers to take it home when the NES launched in North America. However, like most early Nintendo titles, the story of Excite Bike began long before the NES released in October of 1985, and what we ultimately received was a watered down version of its Japanese counterparts. And I can't wait to share all the secrets and history with you in today's video. And I'll even throw in a few tips to help bring your Excite Bike game to the next level. So, gentlemen, start your engines and let's get started. And if this is your first time here at the channel, my name is Tyler, and if you love gaming from all generations like we do here at G3, then consider hitting that subscribe button and hit that bell for notifications so you don't miss anything. During the late 70s and early 80s, a young man named Shigeru Miyamoto had been honing his game design skills for a few Nintendo arcade games like Donkey Kong, and early Famicom sports titles like baseball, tennis, and golf. Miyamoto faced a new challenge in creating Excite Bike, as it would be the first sports title for the Famicom that he would not only be a designer, but also the director and producer. This would also be the first sports game Takashi Tezuka would have a hand in helping Miyamoto design shortly after joining Nintendo. But Excite Bike was actually the second Famicom game that Miyamoto wore the director, producer, and designer hats. His first game taking on all three roles was named Devil World, and this was the first Famicom title that he and Tezuka would develop together. Devil World is not your typical Miyamoto-styled game, which is basically a rip-off of the Pac-Man maze game concept, where you are a heroic and lovable little dragon who must collect dots and various religious objects such as crucifixes and Bibles to defeat the devil who is ever looming at the top of the maze. This would be the only Miyamoto game that wasn't released on the NES because of Nintendo of America's strict policies on not including religious imagery. Devil World is definitely not Miyamoto's best work, but it seems it was a great learning experience as to what to do and not to do when crafting future Famicom titles like Excite Bike. And Excite Bike is where you can start to see many of the innovative principles that Miyamoto uses to construct a successful video game, such as using the strengths and limitations of the NES hardware to influence a game's design. Miyamoto liked to implement scrolling in his Famicom games, because its pixel-level scrolling technology allowed for a much smoother side-scroll experience than other competitors, like the ColecoVision and the Sega Mark I. But there was a flaw in the process of smooth scrolling. While we do know that the Famicom and NES hardware can produce smooth horizontal and vertical scrolling in games like Metroid, these changes in direction take place on different screens but scrolling in both the horizontal and vertical directions at the same time is where it becomes an issue. For instance, Devil World's gameplay centers around the devil being able to shift the playing field in any way he desires. There is enough memory for the hardware to allow for smooth horizontal movement, but the vertical movement is choppy and even jarring, and workarounds to this limitation would not be developed until later when extra RAM chips could be placed in a game cartridge to allow smooth scrolling in all directions. It is reasonable to assume that if Miyamoto wanted to implement scrolling in his next project, Excite Bike, then it would be executed in only one orientation. I believe his decision to make Excite Bike a side-scrolling racer was influenced by the fact that Miyamoto always likes to do things differently. He once stated, It's a trend, and I try to avoid all trends and the racing trend of the early 80s focused more on vertically scrolling games, like Pole Position, Spy Hunter, and even Nintendo's first racing title for the Famicom, named F1 Race. Choosing a horizontal perspective would immediately set Excite Bike apart from the rest, and it's the special attentions to detail in this perspective that helped Miyamoto establish three of his other crucial elements in developing a good video game, and those are simplicity, a sense of accomplishment, and its immersive quality. First off is simplicity. Miyamoto strives to make games that anyone can pick up and play, with a clear concept and goal for the player in mind, 
and what can be more simple than trying to race to the finish line as fast as possible. A race also easily implements a sense of satisfaction and accomplishment through coming in first place and collecting a trophy or personal best time trial. Miyamoto immerses the player by not only having responsive controls, but a slightly elevated force perspective that allows the player to change lanes and create more challenging interactions with other racers and obstacles. But the subtle yet key element in Excite Bike's immersion is Miyamoto's choice to use motorcycles instead of cars. This allows for a more personal connection to your racer than a driver hidden inside of a car because you can see him as an individual riding the bike, popping wheelies, and even desperately trying to rush back to his motorcycle after a crash. And let's not forget that a vital factor in Excite Bike's appeal to gamers was its design mode, which allows players to create and race on their own custom tracks. But we will get more in depth on this topic later in the video. When you consider the care and passion the development team put into creating Excite Bike, it's no surprise that the game struck a chord with gamers when it first released on the Famicom on November 30th, 1984. A versus Excite Bike arcade title was released shortly after in Japan in late 1984 and in North America in 1985 to create brand recognition and demand for a home console version for the NES, which would be releasing in the US later that year. The arcade title was similar to the Famicom version, with only the addition of two more tracks and a bonus round to jump your bike over trucks. Due to the straightforward motocross racing concept, the marketing strategy of Versus Excite Bike in North America paid off, as it helped the NES port of Excite Bike eventually become the third best selling black box title once it released in October 1985 only trailing behind Super Mario Bros. and Duck Hunt, which we all know were bundled with the console itself. Once again, simplicity was the hallmark of Excite Bike's success on the NES. The true-to-pixel artwork on the box didn't overhype expectations of what the gameplay would be once you started racing. There are two modes of play, with Selection A being a simple time trial and Selection B being a pseudo competition with other racers, but it was still just a glorified time trial, with the additional racers simply adding new obstacles to navigate around. The controls are intuitive and basic, with A being the accelerator and B being the turbo button, which you had to use cautiously to avoid that dreaded overheating alarm that players likely recall vividly to this day. The basic premise is to successfully complete each of the five tracks by placing third place or better in each race. After completing the fifth track, it will just continue to loop additional fifth track races with increasing difficulty with no true ending or final race to strive for, which I find a little disappointing and even contradictory given that Miyamoto likes to give players a sense of accomplishment like we discussed earlier. The design mode is definitely where the NES version of Excitebike is most flawed. I'm sure anyone watching this video can relate to taking the time to build your custom tracks and having a great time playing them, but knowing in the back of your mind that they will be erased the moment you turned off your NES. Even the manual tells you that the save and load features are not operable in this game, but they tried to convey a glimmer of hope by saying that they have been programmed for potential product developments. Famicom owners did have the option to save their tracks, even though it was not an easy task. You had to have additional accessories in the form of the cassette-based Famicom data recorder and the Family Basic keyboard, and you would have to time the recording and playing of the cassette tape properly for it to save correctly. But the ultimate home console version of Excitebike wouldn't even reach North America during the Famicom and NES era and that would be Versus Excitebike that was only released for the Famicom Disk System in 1988. This version featured an entirely new soundtrack, a simultaneous two-player mode, and the ability to easily save tracks to its writable disc. Luckily, we all have access to this version now in Nintendo's online service on the Switch, so I suppose it's better late than never. We have already driven home the fact that the basic gameplay in Excitebike doesn't require great explanation, but literally every second counts in a time trial based racing game. So now let's reveal some pro tips to help shift your Excitebike skills into a higher gear. 
Number one is proper landing technique. The key to success in this game is maintaining speed. Even though it sounds obvious, proper landing techniques may just be the most critical fundamental element to setting you apart from the average excite bike player. Luckily the concept is simple. Just always be aware of the surface orientation of where you are going to land after a jump, and make sure your wheels are parallel to that surface to ensure a smooth transition back to the ground. Number 2. Protect your front wheel. The main problem to avoid is any contact with your front wheel. Just a slight wheelie right before a small bump is enough to traverse it effortlessly, and you should strive to never approach or change lanes behind another racer to avoid this issue. But I actually encourage changing lanes and messing with other racers when you're in front of them to take their front tire out with your rear tire. Number 3. Temperature Meter Hacks Maximizing the time you can use the turbo button without overheating is of most importance in mastering Excite Bike. Notice that at the beginning of each race, the temperature meter isn't completely empty and starts right here. But there is a cool little trick to start with a temperature meter a bit lower, and that happens at the track select screen. Wait until the music stops during the select screen, and make sure you are holding the B button down before you press start. Then continue to hold the B button until the race starts. You will notice that the temperature gauge will be slowly increasing from zero before the race begins, but it will be slightly below its normal starting point if you started the race before the music ended. Number 4. Super Speed and Jump Hacks Now this one is by far my favorite strategy to practice. Let's break down the best method to practice collecting super speed. Design a custom track by placing cooldown arrows with the letter M. Lay down approximately 10 arrows with a couple spaces between each arrow. After placing the last one, throw down a jump ramp with the letter H. Now keep repeating this pattern until the editor automatically places a finish line. This type of track will ensure that you can perform many consecutive jumps while holding down the turbo button and avoid overheating. This method of gaining speed, which in turn will increase jump height, all centers around bouncing off your front tire with precise timing of both your controller holds and taps. Begin the track by pressing B, and do not let go of the B button the entire time you are practicing this sequence. At the same time, keep holding down right on the D-pad, even after you jump and are flying in the air. Continue to hold right until just a split second before you hit the ground and quickly tap the left direction once and then immediately back to holding right. Just continue this process and you will get amazing speed and heights from your jumps, and eventually even pop up through the bottom of the screen. Even if you don't master the technique well enough to fully incorporate it into your races, it is still a cool trick to pull off in editing mode. Excitebike has left a profound legacy on so many levels. It's the ninth best-selling NES title, and even the fifth best-selling Famicom game of all time. Given its massive success, it's strange there have only been a few follow-up titles released in the franchise over the years. Some may find it hard to believe that a game as simplistic as Excitebike would ever be considered one of the most influential video games of all time, but I would argue that Excitebike and Devil World should both be part of that discussion because even Miyamoto admits the aesthetics of the large sprite design from Devil World and the smooth side-scrolling elements of Excitebike is what helped shape the designs he and Tezuka would implement in their next big project they would develop together. And I would say there's a good chance you've heard of this game. And who knows, we may even cover that game on the channel here someday. Special shout out to our friends Patrick McCabe and Master Search for finding Mullet Boy first in our last video. Till next time guys. G3 out.